Hello and good day. This is Chuck Hardwick Jr. and I am talking to my dad, Chuck Hardwick Sr. Today is May the 7th, 2020 and this is episode 8 and I'm in my home office in the Ocean Beach neighborhood of San Diego and my dad is in his home office or not his home office he's in his home in Palm Beach <laughs> Gardens Florida sorry about that how are you today dad good to see you son things are fine here today well good it's good to see you too and uh, tell us your current thoughts on the state of this horrible pandemic well since the last time we talked the good news is the club has opened up a bit I played the first round of golf I played in I know a couple of months and things are gradually relaxing. I know there's a lot of concern about that, but we are continuing to be hypersensitive ourselves with uh, hand washing and that, that kind of things. Uh, I have uh, scheduled a medical procedure for next week, elective medical procedure. So Cleveland Clinic is uh, opening up. So those uh, things are good. Okay, interesting. Well, that sort of transitions nicely as today's episode we're calling Science for the World's Well-Being, uh, which talks about uh, your experience uh, starting off at Pfizer um, as a sales rep. So uh, take us back to uh, your, your job as a sales rep and tell us a little bit about your, your territory. First of all, where were you working in uh, your first job at Pfizer? Well, the Pfizer corporate motto was science for the world's well-being. And I was hired to start on the east side of uh, a little bit of Detroit, but mostly the suburbs, Mount Clemens, St. Clair Shores. And if you know the geography of Michigan, you know there's something called the thumb. It goes all the way up uh, through uh, a beautiful part of lower Michigan to uh, St. Lake St. Clair, city of uh, St. Clair. So it's really a, a mix of rural and uh, suburban, a little bit of big city territory. We had about three or 400 clients, uh, drugstores, physicians, clinics, hospitals uh, to call on. It was really a great job and I simply loved it. Uh, especially after the uh, experience I had at Wonder Bread, which was well-intentioned, but I've talked before, didn't see a bright future there, uh, the working conditions, on this new Pfizer job were just terrific. I was on my own, the uh, harder I worked, I knew the better job I would get, the better job I would do. I was dealing with more professionals, with physicians and nurses and uh, doctors, receptionists and pharmacists, and then with the grocers on the east side of Detroit. And it got off to a really great start. I liked it very much. Well, that's really interesting. You know, I've always heard sales jobs described as inside sales where you're on the phone and outside sales where you're calling on people. And then some sales jobs are both, where you're setting appointments on the phone and then meeting in person. How much of it was setting appointments on the phone and then following up and meeting with people? Or was it just kind of catch as catch can when you showed up at a doctor's office or a pharmacy somewhere in Michigan? Well, you, <clears throat> you had somewhat of a routine. You, you wanted to call on your good prescribers at least once a month if you could. I noticed in the wintertime in uh, Michigan, heavy snows uh, on the road, and a lot of sales reps didn't really want to do that. But I learned that the sales reps who would go up there when the weather was bad, the doctors appreciated it, the nurses appreciated it. Then in the summertime, when you went back and everybody wanted to see the doctors, they'd see you first because they knew that you came up to, in January and February and the snows were piled up uh, uh, sky high. Uh, so it, it, it wasn't really phone calling like we have now, or we didn't have computers at the time uh, out in the field. It was a matter really of having some idea, keeping the hours, knowing when to go, maybe bringing uh, some token gifts to the receptionist, like some Packwood's hand cream, but we used to have some samples of Cody perfume, which Pfizer owned at the time. And it became uh, much more of a personal relationship. They were, you hoped they were glad to see you. You were glad to see them. You tried to respect the, the hours, uh, the doctor's time, tried to be brief. Uh, you would go back and check your samples. We had what called starter samples. You get in the back room and check the samples. Well, I has uh, said uh, a sales presentation then was referred to as a detail. And we were called detail men. There weren't any women doing it, the detail men. And we also had, it's called a doorknob detail, something that you could do in about 30 seconds 
to reinforce uh, the use of your product. So there was a, there was a lot to it, a lot of personal relationships, a lot of a lot of hard work, uh, staying longer hours, making the calls, and getting your message across. So that's pretty different from what you did at Wonder Bread. I'm sure there must have been some sort of training, or how did they bring you up to speed as to best practices on calling on the doctors and pharmacies and others like that? Well, there was training, and uh, the interesting thing about the job of a pharmaceutical sales rep is that you study a very narrow slice of medicine and disease and, and drugs. And by studying it enough, you got to know that as well as many doctors would know it. And you could then bring them information. You could bring them new clinical studies. You could bring them new information about your products. And one of the unrealized real advantages of the whole system of having pharmaceutical sales reps is that we were a really good source of information about our competitors' products. Because often you were uh, comparing your product to theirs, and it was important to know their weaknesses, their side effects. And so it would not be unusual to say, well, my penicillin, of course, doctor can be given on an empty stomach, and the, the competitive product has to be given with food, that kind of thing. You would remind them of the benefits of yours and the shortcomings of the others. So the training was ongoing. It was uh, initially done in office. And then later, uh, I think it was two or three weeks, we went to New York to meet people, to meet with the uh, physicians who were working on the products, the marketers, and other sales reps from around the country. But it was an ongoing process. Every sales meeting we had at the district level was uh, at least half uh, training. So uh, it was an important part of the job. Interesting. Um, so I actually, you sent me some photos with regards to the training and some other items. Um, oh, and yes. So this is a, a postcard that you sent out to some of the doctors. Um, talk us through how did this work with this postcard? What was this all about? Well, that was to remind them, uh, first of all, of us. And I, thought, I don't know if the doctors saw it or not, but the, uh, certainly the office receptionist did. I was with the J.B. Roehrig division of Pfizer. Uh, Roehrig had been a vitamin company that Pfizer bought and bought the sales reps that came with it. So Pfizer had two sales divisions, Pfizer Labs division and Roehrig division. So I was part, I was a Pfizer employee, but we worked under the Roehrig label, um, Roehrig label. I gave Pfizer the benefit of not having just one, but two sales reps calling on a doctor in a period of a month. So it increased their marketing reach and their sales reach. Uh, so I went, to, I went to New York for a training program and um, a strange thing happened there beyond my control. A group of us on a, on a Friday night went out after being in training all week and we went to a, a bar, nightclub, a dance kind of area. Remember the name of it was a carousel. It wasn't too far from the Roosevelt Hotel where we were staying. And some of these sales reps with me <clears throat> started trying to hit upon some girls who were there, I, re I recall. I don't remember all the real details. But what I do remember is when we all left the carousel and started walking towards the hotel, uh, another guy and I were, for some reason, in the lead. We went first and walked by an alley. And then the guys behind us came along and fellows came out of the alley with either chains or uh, some kind of clubs and jumped on them and yelled about you, know, you should leave our girls alone and boom boom beat them and they were down on the sidewalk probably didn't happen in more than 15 or 20 seconds but you don't have to hit a guy with a club too many times and bring him down so it was a sad event uh, i waited there with them we called the, whatever you called back then i remember 911 or what ambulance came and i went with bell to bellevue hospital with one of, I was in an ambulance with one, another ambulance and another one. And checked them in, saw that they were admitted and told them who we were and everything. And the next morning I got a call at, uh, back at the hotel, got a call from the national sales manager named Larry Larkin, who thanked me for what I did and asked me if he could, if I could go to the hospital with him that morning and I did. So he came to the hotel and then he and I went to, uh, to Bellevue. And he said, uh, Chuck, I'm really glad that you were sober and you weren't involved in, in any of the behavior that resulted in all this 
all this fighting and everything, and you took care of your fellow uh, Rory uh, sales reps. So that kind of brought me to their attention in a positive way, which nothing, I mean, I just did what anybody else would have done in the situation. And, it's, and he remembered, Larry Larkin remembered that experience and referred to it uh, many times in, in later years when at one point I ended up being his assistant. And so um, it was a memorable part of our early training. I do have I, an old picture here, but I'm not gonna try to bring it out. But it was all the sales class seated at a uh, table having dinner at the Roosevelt, done by a professional photographer. And as I looked at it not long ago, I think maybe it would be useful in this, in this episode, the, the faces were too small. But what I noticed, of course, there was a, a single woman and there was one African-American uh, in the picture. And the times certainly uh, have changed since then, but that's, that's the way the world was at that point. Very, very interesting. And so was that the first time you had ever been to New York City? It was the first time I'd been to New York City. And it was really, it was really good training in a lot of ways. And I, was, I felt empowered and certainly loved seeing New York. We didn't do much in the way of touring, but we, we did see New York. Stayed in, I mentioned the Roosevelt Hotel. I remember going out for Sunday morning breakfast and my gosh, they had a part of the restaurant closes off for the Pittsburgh Pirates baseball team was in town and oh, staying wow. at that hotel. And I thought that was the coolest thing that, <laughs> that I could have possibly have seen. So I went back to my territory and prepared to, uh, to do the job. It's important to know there, there really, there were two kinds of um, physician markets. One was a regular prescribing. You talk to the doctor about the products, ask them to prescribe it or urge them to. Maybe we gave them some starter samples. And the others were ph physicians who were dispensing physicians. And that meant that they would actually buy the products and then generally sell them to their uh, patients. And this was uh, a cultural thing. It didn't happen in all markets, but it's very common then in Michigan, especially where I was in the upper part of, um, of Michigan, more rural area. You'd have to travel to drugstores. So we, we had a promotion for our prenatal vitamins. And it was intended principally for drugstores, but the promotion was very simple. If you bought $400 worth of vitamins, you got a free black and white portable television set. Now, uh, I, I went online to see how much a dollar then was now, and it's about $8 difference. So that was a, it'd be a $3,200 purchase. That's a lot of money uh, that you were asking the doctors to uh, spend. But I figured out the implication of it. In almost every instance, the doctors were in a 50% or more income tax bracket. So I had said to them, we have a special promotion, but doctor, it's only useful for you if you are in a 50% income tax bracket and you could use a free uh, television set. And they said, well, what's, what's, the, what's the deal? I said, well, $400 expenditure on or investment on uh, our prenatal Obron that really out of pocket only cost you 200 because 200 of that 400 would go to taxes. So it's costing you 200 really. And you will get a free TV that's worth 200. So what we're really doing is giving you all these vitamins free. You can then sell them to your OB patients if you want, or you can say, here, you know, you're my patient, I like to take care of my patients. Here's your free prenatal vitamins but you would have to pay 15, 10 or $15 for or something in the store. And I, I sold eight of those deals, uh, which was uh, really a great sell, $3,200. <clears throat> my whole, my quota that year, my whole total sales quota for all products was about $8,000. And headquarters wanted to know, how did you sell all of those vitamins to doctors? And it was pretty simple, just by uh, using basic, Knowing the, knowing the IRS tax rates and using basic uh, sales principles. But that was, a, that was a lot of fun. Well, you really leveraged that promotion nicely. And um, what I find so interesting is how much TVs have come down in price. Because I think you said <laughs> in tax or, or inflation adjusted dollars, the TV was like $3,200 for a little black and white. No, the TV was worth about 200 200 in 1965 dollars which is right 
worth a lot more now. Six, fifteen hundred or sixteen hundred dollars now, right? Right. And I think did we have one of those TVs? Yes. Did you end up with one. I remember. Yes, that. I ended up with one. I I I think they gave Pfizer gave me one because of uh, having sold so many. They said, "Well, you know, we should give you one." I but think that it was, was in my bedroom for a while. I think that yeah, probably. <laughs> Thanks, it Dan, was fun. It was it was fun selling to dispensers. Uh, I, another sell I had, we had a cough uh, capsule called Cory Band D that happened to look like one of the most expensive antibiotics, a product called Lincosin that Upjohn made. And my sales pitch to the doctors on that would be, doctor, sometimes the patient has a viral infection, they've got a cold, and they want an antibiotic. They want to get well, and you know that antibiotic isn't really what they want. Well, if you give them a Cory Band, and I would take it out, and I had a Lincosin, I said, Look at the comparison between these two products. You can give them the Coriban, which is really better for them and will make them feel better. But it looks like an expensive antibiotic. You don't have to tell them. It's up to you what you tell them, but it's really the right product for them. And the Coriban only costs you a couple of cents a capsule, whereas the Lincosin they even buy and stock it, don't cost you like 50 cents a capsule. And so it's, it's really a better alternative for the patient and a better alternative for you for viral infections and colds. And, flu stuff. I, I sold a, a bunch of that to dispensing doctors. Uh, and it was, it was really a lot of fun. I really like you sell to the dispenser. You felt like you've really made a sale. You know, you, you leave with the order in your, with the order in your hand. That's a good feeling when you make a, a sale. And um, so in terms of um, your quota, the first year, do you remember, uh, it sounds like you, you hit your quota and went well over with the TV promotion and the, the other thing you were just I really did. I, I remember, the, were you like 125% uh, uh, of quota or? I don't, remember, I don't remember the percentages, but I remember my bonus. <laughs> my, my bonus was uh, about $2,000 and, and, and I led the district. And, and one, of the, one of the ways that I was successful is that I did something then called script checking. And script checking, especially up in the rural areas, the stores were happy to see you many times. I checked my inventory, see what I would need to order. And then I could go through, most pharmacists would let me look at the prescriptions and see the, what the doctors were prescribing. And that was so important because then you knew how to gauge your, your sales presentation to them. You knew what they were uh, prescribing for. You knew what products they used, what competitive products they were using. So you knew then how to really hone your, your presentation. But what, is that, that a violation of uh, HIPAA laws? Well, no, there was no HIPAA back oh, then. Oh, this is pre-HIPAA. Okay. That's way, but the, uh, the truth of the matter is I, could, I didn't look at the patient's names. I didn't oh, know I them, didn't want to know them, didn't care, didn't matter to me. But uh, there was criticism of the practice. And so Pfizer discontinued it. I think, I'm not sure exactly when, but we were told you not to script check anymore. But this being America and capitalism, uh, people saw the need for that information to be available. And the companies were started that went to doctors and had the doctors write pres a, uh, uh, a duplicate prescription and mail that into the company and they pay the doctors for the information and later to drugstores to uh, get the information from the doctors, I mean, from the druggists, what doctors were prescribing what. And now all that's available, readily available, and the, the companies buy it, buy that information. So the sales reps know what doctors, they know who the high prescribers are, they know what they're prescribing and so forth. So it just shows that they stopped the sales reps from doing it, but the need was still there. And so the marketplace responded to it. So I got that $2,000 bonus uh, from leading this week on a big trophy that I was uh, proud of. And that money then became the down payment. Oh, there I'm posing with my, uh, <laughs> posing with my uh, trophy. Uh, that was in Dearborn after we had gotten the money. And I then used that uh, $2,000 bonus, which today would be like $16,000 uh, for the down payment of the home. And voila, there it is. It was near my territory. It's in uh, Mount Clemens. I bought that home for $19,000. It was a well-made home. Jim Morris, who I spoke finally of before, I remember went with me and talked about the features of the, of the home that had marble window sills and good copper plumbing and that, that kind of thing. Because I didn't know much about the, 
about what a home should be like when I was buying my first home. Um, so that was uh, a good, <clears throat> turned out to be a pretty good investment. Awesome. And so I'll show some more pictures of that home. Oh. I think you we you fixed up the basement for your office or something like that, didn't you? Right. That that was my office. I had uh, obviously I don't remember whether I put up the siding or whether the paneling was already there. I just don't remember that, but I do remember the office down in the basement. And I do remember we had a screened in porch that we, we enjoyed with the fence around. In fact, there's the fence and there's a great picture of you and your sister, Ginger, in the backyard in Mount Clemens. That was a nice little backyard back there. And um, so, and then there's a couple other pictures. I'm not sure this one has anything to do with what we're talking about, but since we're- Well, what picture, it, yeah, it did. Well, it did because it enabled me, unlike being in Florida, it enabled me to be able to come back to see mom and dad Jansen to bring you guys there. Um, because it wasn't that far from uh, Michigan down to Akron for a few hours drive. And then later on, we, when we lived in Toledo, we were closer. But on the left-hand side, of course, with glasses is Pat, and then you, and then Ginger. And then Mom Johnson is showing over Pat's head, right? And then uh, Dad Johnson, and then sister, Pat's sister, Carol, and uh, Carl Suter. I guess that they were married by then. I'm pretty sure they were. And then next to Carl is Mrs. Suter, Carl's mother, and then Bobby. So many fine meals at mom and dad Johnson's house. They were, they were wonderful people. They were sure good to me and I loved them very much. Great, and then, so you did really well with Pfizer and they wanted, probably they wanted you to start training some of the other guys that were new and is that how you got promoted and, and and tell us about how you started to move up within the organization well that summer was really a hectic summer in 1967 uh, when i got my promotion it was also the year of the detroit race riots and boy i was sure glad that i was out of the east side of detroit because much of it was burned down those poor guys at wonder bread and every place else went through a lot in fact, in Mount Clemens, we were near an Air Force base, and we could hear the helicopters flying over all night long, taking National Guard troops from Selfridge Air Force Base, I think it was, uh, down to uh, Detroit. Really uh, very, uh, very tough times. But I was offered a promotion to go to Chicago and be the district hospital manager in the Chicago South District. And that was selling to teaching hospitals particularly, which is a far different sales presentation far different sales environment than I had had calling on friendly doctors in, uh, in Michigan. It was far more, uh, had to, presentations had to be far more scientific, clinically, uh, clinical base oriented, uh, hard to get in a lot of the hospitals. Uh, sales reps weren't allowed many times to go up on the floors. Uh, it was very difficult, a very difficult environment to work, but it was very fascinating. Um, we, we bought our second home. I was very discouraged at the high price of homes. Remember the Floyd Wilson was my new district manager uh, driving me around and I said, I don't know if I can take this job. I don't know if I can afford to live here. But we lived, we found a home in Lyle, Illinois for $22,000. Uh, a little 10% uh, more, I guess, than we had paid. But it was a fascinating job working those big, big hospitals in, in, uh, in Chicago and selling to them being as different as it was. One of my, um, one of my uh, customers was uh, Beatty Memorial uh, Hospital for the Criminally Insane. It was down in Indiana. And we had a new product for schizophrenia called Nave. And we, we, <clears throat> we were told and figured out there are a lot of schizophrenics who are in mental, uh, not only mental hospitals, but criminally insane. So I remember going there and being um, somewhat intimidated at first because when you went in, you were searched and then they sealed doors shut behind you and you went through another door and another door and then you'd be in finally where, where the doctors were and talk about your products, but it was uh, very fascinating. So you didn't have to be crazy to work there, but boy, did it help. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Uh, Any other interesting stories? Well, yes. Uh, one of the, the biggest challenges there was Cook County Hospital. 
big bureaucracy. It was the public hospital, horrendously busy and very fascinating place to work. So we had a product, an injectable tranquilizer called Atarax. And I mentioned the other Pfizer division, they had a product called Vistaril. And the products were absolutely identical. There was no difference between them except the label and which division sold it. So I kept calling on the anesthesiology people uh, with clinical papers about how important it is to use a, a product like Atarax because you can use less narcotics, relaxes the patient. And finally, I gave them a few vials to try and they were, they were willing to try it. And they liked the results very much. And so I got my first big order from there. I remember it was um, for 100 vials, I think at $5 a vial is a $500 order. Remember now that would be $4,000 in, in uh, purchasing power. It helped with your quota and, quite a bit too. Your well, quota absolutely. was based on dollars more than it was on, right. on units, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Because I remember when the invoice came uh, to me from this, uh, eventually from the store, the regional manager had written on there, Gloria and Excelsis Deo. You know, <laughs> great praise be to God. But, but part of the story that's interesting, there, there are two parts really. One, the um, purchasing order at the hospital, the purchasing office said, here's your copy of the order, it's done. Doctors are waiting for the product. So I was waiting to get the invoice. So gone through. I waited, I waited. It seemed like I waited a long time. So I went to the purchasing people at the Cook County Hospital and I said, what can I do? They said, well, they said, we, we, we send it downtown. You can try downtown. So I found my way down, where is purchasing done? Down in the city hall, down in the basement. There was a little old lady sitting at a desk and someone said she does pharmaceuticals for the city. And so I went over and as I sat down at her desk, on the corner of the desk were raffle tickets uh, to, uh, for a local alderman. And I sat down and introduced myself and everything. And she said, I don't know. She didn't seem to know much about it. And I said, oh, by the way, are, are, are these available? Can I, can I buy some of these? She said, oh, well, yeah, sure. They just happen to be there. And I said, well, I don't remember. It's like $5 or $10. I, don't know. I said, oh, I've heard of him. He's really a good man. And I bought a couple of raffle tickets. And, and gave her the money and everything. She said, she reached the door, she, oh, well, here's your, here's your order, <laughs> and stamped it, and boom. She said, it'll go out today. <laughs> That's how the world, she was, I think, waiting for me to uh, come down. So Cook County got the uh, Atarax in, and I, I thanked them and everything in the anesthesiology, and I, I said to them, I've sold a lot of this, but I've never really seen it used. Could I come early some morning and watch patients being medicated with it? So really see how the patients respond. And I said, yeah, you can do that. And so they arranged, I was to come in real early, uh, five o'clock, I don't remember how early. Or, and they, uh, they put me in scrubs, uh, blue or green or some scrubs and a hat and everything, just like the doctors. And so I went in and I saw the anesthesiology residents who I'd gotten to know really well. One of them was a big fan of a particular kind of gin that I happened to give him a few boodles gin I happened to get him a few bottles of and he, he he was using the product and I was standing watching everything going on there it's a big big operation and suddenly code red code red code red Thanks. and the doctor ran over to there was a patient uh lying on a, on a stretcher and had been pre-medicated I don't know whether it was Hatterax or not but he got he had a heart attack and the uh, uh, intern was there pump, pumping him on the chest. You know, and I was watching, I thought, oh, wow. And then after a while, he looked over, he saw me and see motion come on. So he wanted me to come over and take a turn. Well, I didn't know how to do chest compression. And I, I was the doctor. He thought I was a doctor. He didn't know. I was a sales rep there watching, watching doctors perform. And finally, some other people came and, and relieved him. So, you know, it didn't. It didn't go on forever. So I felt really bad about it because he got angry. He felt that I was shirking my responsibility and just leaving everything up to him. But the man died, unfortunately. And then I asked, I asked the doctor later, what happened? He said, well, he had knee surgery and a blood clot went from his knee up to his heart. And I found that that's a pretty common um, 
uh, pretty common happening to get blood clots in these surgery, at least back then it was. Oh, that's a really um, sad story to hear it had that ending, but uh, obviously made an impression on you. So I got a little bit lost. So when you were, you were the sales rep in Michigan, that was like the entry level. And then in, when we moved to Lyle, was that a lateral move or were you then, uh, or is it a, a promotion based on a bigger, more important territory? Well, it was a promotion. It's typically seen you are the trainer for new people inside the district to orient them. You would work with other sales reps to how to work a hospital. You expect to be, to be the expert on how to get hospital sales because they were really different. How to get up on the floors, oh, you know, how to talk, uh, uh, approach the formulary committees, which not, the doctors couldn't use just any drug they wanted. They had to use drugs that were on the list on the formulary. So it was a senior sales position and a quasi-management and it was a, uh, to be a stepping stone. And, and by the way, uh, the, the house in Lyle turned out to be really nice. We had a big yard. Uh, we had good friends. I remember the Rodneys, uh, Vinny Rodney was a friend of yours yeah. or, or, or Ginger. I planted tomatoes in the backyard because uh, the backyard was uh, great. We had, did cookouts. Uh, Lyle was a very peaceful, uh, really nice uh, uh, place to be. Uh, the, the only time was a problem uh, <laughs> with Lyle. I had won a, a contest as a, uh, as a district hospital manager. And the reward was to take my wife to a show and dinner in downtown Chicago. So that was great. I said that. In fact, the play Pat wanted to see was, you know, I can't hear you when the water's running. So I went down, uh, found the theater, the Blackstone Theater, I think it was. And I remember being in the theater, there were a couple of guys looking at posters and so forth. And walked over, took my wallet out, and I bought two tickets for Saturday night. And then I felt something pushing in my back. And the guy said, this is a robbery. We have this man as a hostage. Give us your money. Oh, my gosh. And, uh, and I said to the guy, I, mean, I said, I can't even see you. You know, here's my wallet. I, I, I won't even look at you. And so the guy behind the counter started putting the the proceeds from the theater there. And the guy grabbed the money. He, he held on to me just a little bit. The other guy joined him. And then they, they held me a little bit. And then they ran out the back door. And as soon as they did, the guy behind the, ca the uh, cashier pulled out a huge, big revolver. <laughs> and then he left it. I guess he was going, crap, I don't know what he's going to do with it. You know? um, so that, uh, that scared me quite a bit. And the police came, of course. And um, the, 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 the police then said, where's your car? And, and they were taking it to, to the car. NBC News was there and wanted to talk to us. And, they said, and um, the police said, oh, you don't want to talk to them. They said, no. And, and they really, they shuttled me into the police car. I realized later they didn't want me to talk to them because Mayor Daley didn't want any bad news coming out of Chicago that somebody was robbed buying theater tickets. Um, so the next day, the Chicago Tribune had a, a little uh, uh, notice about the robbery. And it said, I think it had my name in it, uh, Hardwick from Lyle, Illinois, was, was uh, at the scene and was a witness and was taken away by the police. So that scared me enough that I went back when I got home. And the next day, I saw that in the paper. We had our name on the mailbox. Uh, and Lyle. I went out and took the Hardwick name off. <laughs> I just left the number. I didn't want somebody out in Lyle looking for, for Hardwick who may be a witness to the crime. Is, so that, there, is that why it took you so long to get on a Facebook? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, there were, there were two guys that fit their description were killed in a supermarket shootout uh, not too long after that. So I, I don't know that that was them, but it sure sounded like, uh, uh, sounded like it was. Palaya was a great place to live for the time that we were there. We enjoyed it. Well, great, Dad. We're, we're about out of time for this episode. This has been great hearing all these great stories. And uh, I look forward to hearing about the, the next part of your life in the upcoming episode. Okay. Well, there's more to talk about. Thanks for being such a good listener. Oh, it's my pleasure. And I hope you have a great afternoon down there in South Florida. We will. You do the same, son. Love you, Dad. Bye-bye. Love you. Bye-bye.